Hi, I'm Matthew Gilbert uh, from the University of Sheffield. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, online webinar on new digital tool design tools for long span structures. So delighted to be joined today by my colleagues. So Ian Firth, a uh, knowledge expert in long span structures from Curvy and current chair of the IPC British group. Uh, Dr. Helen Fairclough, who's a research fellow at the University of Sheffield. Uh, Dr. Tom Pritchard, who's a principal engineer at the engineering software company Limit State, and uh, Daniel Green, who's a principal engineer at uh, Curvy UK. So we've got quite a packed program for you today. Um, first half, we've got three talks, uh, and then we're going to have a, a comfort break. And then in the second half, we've got a couple of talks and also a, an online uh, interactive session where you'll be able to use the, the new uh, tool, Layout Bridge, and hopefully come up with some interesting designs for yourselves. And then we'll uh, aim to wrap up uh, around uh, half past uh, half past five uh, today. In terms of housekeeping, um, please use the Q&A functionality to ask questions anytime. We'll either answer those uh, in, in text or later on there might be an opportunity to, to answer a few of your questions uh, verbally uh, during the interactive session. Um, last thing before I introduce the first speaker, uh, just uh, let you know this event is brought to you by ICARE, the Integrated Civil and Infrastructure Research Centre, which is a new University of Sheffield Centre and the, the mission of the centre is to act as a catalyst for the introduction of technologies capable of delivering step change in the sector. So hopefully uh, uh, we'll get a taste of that in this, in this uh, event today. But anyway, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first speaker, Ian Firth, who's going to talk to you about the importance of material efficiency. OK, thank you, Matthew. I hope uh, you can hear me. Hopefully one of you will say something if you can't. Um, um, I'm, as Matthew kindly introduced me, I'm uh, Ian Firth from Colby. I, I have um, been fortunate enough to work on long span bridges most of my working life. Um, and so uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me to be able to, uh, to, to uh, talk to you about this. I'm actually pressing things and nothing's happening. So let me just try uh, my slides. I don't know, Tom, whether you can advance the slides because they're not working from here. Ah, that's better. Um, so the importance of material efficiency and, and long spans. I mean, I, you know, this is really about long span structures because uh, this is what, where the sort of the, this particular tool, this digital tool that we're going to be hearing lots about today kind of evolved. And I, I, I got involved um, when Matthew asked me to do so uh, some uh, year or two ago. ago. Um, you know, Seven Bridges, if you like, the kind of father of the modern world of suspension bridges. Uh, 1965, um, with a with a span, you know, these days a relatively modest span of of 988 meters, under a thousand meters. But even back then, um, you know, long span bridges mean light weight. You have to minimize the weight because the weight has a massive impact on uh, on the uh, output, uh, the, the the resulting structure. And seven is actually one of the lightest suspension bridges anywhere. It's about seven tons a meter, which is um, as light as you're going to get really. Uh, for that kind of that kind of structure, uh, the other end of the spectrum, the current longest span, the Akashi Kyoku Bridge in Japan, which is a truss structure, as you can see, a truss girder, um, that is uh, about three times that in terms of weight per meter. Uh, Japanese didn't seem to mind about that too much, uh, but as we'll see in a few moments, um, you know, minimum weight potentially comes with a penalty as well. Um, the current uh, longest span under construction at the moment, 2023, this is, this is a recent photograph from the Chernakhil Bridge in Turkey, uh, which we've been working on. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, an extraordinary uh, structure. Uh, and, and again, lightweight is absolutely critical. We have to minimize weight. And, you know, the suspension bridge form is well familiar to all of us, isn't it? And, and we sort of naturally assume the suspension bridge form uh, for, for long spans. But I think as we'll see, um, you know, it is a form that that, that is it lends itself well to this kind of structure. It's very efficient. This is Messina Bridge, the longest span designed to date, 3,300 meters, fully detailed but not yet built. So there's a question mark about the construction date there. Um, but you know, these structures are are enormous, um, and you know, we know that suspension bridges are are, are getting longer. Um, and indeed, we're now looking at multiple span structures like this. 
Uh, this is a study we've done recently, um, you, you know, where if you've got a very long crossing, uh, where clearly, you know, you're going to need to break it down into sort of manageable lengths. Uh, and, and that was, was modeled on a, some work we've done previously on Yemen, Djibouti uh, and Gibraltar. Uh, and, you know, the reason why you have that kind of A-shaped structure is because when you uh, have a sort of patch load, as you can see along the bottom there, you know, if you load one span, um, in a multiple span uh, situation where the tower top, the adjacent tower tops are not anchored back to the ground, if you like, to an anchorage, to a fixed point, then those towers try to move inwards. Uh, and so you need to triangulate that. You need to, to do something to stiffen that system. Uh, and, um, you know, that is where this kind of suspension bridge system begins to struggle with that kind of uh, system when you go into multiple spans. But as we'll see a little later on, uh, you know, there are other forms that begin to evolve. So what about um, uh, some of the other things that, that a long span designer has to think about? And obviously aerodynamics is one of them. Um, aerodynamic stability for, for long spans is one of the key design factors. And of course, the lighter weight you go, the more difficult it gets. And as span increases, as you get longer and longer spans, vertical, tors vertical and torsional frequencies tend to converge. Uh, and the critical wind speed can't be achieved with a single box. So we tend to find that uh, you need to go towards a multi-cell box. The truss design begins to get a real problem because of drag. Uh, you can see there some some figures, which are the uh, the frequency ratios for some for some of those bridges as mentioned. And I haven't got time to go into the niceties of the chart on the left. But this is a major issue, aerodynamic stability, which we have to design for. Um, and wind drag as well, you know, long spans mean, you know, you get a lot of wind, which, um, and, and as the span increases, that load ends up going to the tower top because the flexibility of the deck is such that all the load heads to the tower top. And so that means tower costs go up and everything. So, so these become big issues. It's not just minimum weight. We have to think about wind as well. And the solution to some of those things is obviously streamlined so as to reduce the, 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 the drag. This is the Messina cross section, so a streamlined section, but also a vented deck. You can see here, this is actually three um, girders with air gaps in between, and, and that is a part of the aerodynamic design of the thing. So these are aerodynamically designed, streamlined deck structures. So that's the solution to that particular problem, in addition to the lightweight. And one aspect of the, light, of, of the weight, which is particularly prevalent in suspension bridges, is the weight of the main cable. Um, you can see in the chart on the left, um, you know, there are various things it's quite difficult to, to work out, but the pale blue is the cable load increasing exponentially with span, whereas the deck load and the load, so the, the, the load in the cable, this is the, the I should explain, sorry, more clearly, the, the, the tension in the cable due to the cable load itself, the load from the deck, the load from the railway, and the load from, from, from the road, i.e. the highway loading. The last three are all linear. With, with span, but the cable load is is not. It is very much not non-linear. So the longer you go, you very rapidly begin to chase your tail. And as you can see there, on the Messina design with the 3,300 meter span, for every ton you add to the deck, you add one and a half tons nearly to the main cable just to carry it. And of course, the solution to that is a higher strength cable or something else. And, and this optimization we're going to be talking about uh, begins to demonstrate that there might be something else which will give us the solution. So here, for example, is the, is the, is the, you know a kind of theoretical curve for the the, the size of the area of the, of the cable, the, the the area or the weight, if you like, of the cable, which gets very very steep uh, and in fact becomes asymptotic uh, before you get very very far. Um, uh, you know, it just becomes uh, ridiculous, and you can see those numbers there. And this is again Messina. Uh, and you can see this is the breakdown of the, 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 the load in the cable, and 78% of the load in the cable is coming from the permanent load of the bridge, all right? 42% of it from the cable itself. So, so you know, you can see why my, my, my optimizing on weight is absolutely critical for a long span bridge design. And these are just a few pictures from the construction of the Osman Ghazi Bridge. That's the Izmit Bridge for those of you who know it that way. Uh, the other thing to think about from an efficiency point of view is it's got to be easy to build. And some of the forms that we might be talking about today, which are minimum weight forms, won't necessarily be easy to build. And so the engineer's task is to is to optimize not just on weight, 
put on these other things, the aerodynamics, the constructability, and so on. Uh, I haven't got time to go into the construction of these things, but you know, these, the construction of these bridges is a, 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 a massive undertaking, and the design has to take all of that into account. How do you build the thing? And the suspension bridge form lends itself very well to construction because you know once you've got the cables up, you're just lifting the girders uh, vertically into position uh, off a barge or whatever. Um, just one last thing, just before I, st before I stop. The other imperative that we are, of course, all facing is the imperative of minimum carbon. And you've all seen pictures like this. This is the, uh, you know, the, the growth in carbon emissions um, over many, many years. Uh, and material efficiency, the thing that we're talking about today, or I'm talking about today, um, is just one part of this much bigger global imperative. That, that curve, if we take the look of it, just the last 60 years of that curve to a different scale, you know, you can see that that's what's been happening. No, no change in direction at all as a result of the last three big summits. You know, there's another one coming up in November, COP26. Let's see what that does. And, you know, frankly, uh, you know, if we're going to get to zero by 2050, you know, we all know that this is complete nonsense. There's no chance that we're going to do that. It's just it's completely impossible. That curve is never going to happen. And, you know, we may be able to do some sort of minimize, minimizing weight, you know, optimizing this and that, maybe a little bit of changing in, in material behaviors and so on, I think, but but it's just tinkering at the edges. We have some radical changes that are needed. So, you know, yes, we need to minimize the weight. Yes, we need to optimize and, and everything, but we need also in this new world we now live in, I say new, it's been around a long time, but it was new to us because we've just woken up to the problem. We have to have some radical changes. So that's enough from me. We need to hear about others. Uh, so thank you so much, Matthew. Um, over, back to you. Thanks very much, Ian. That's, that's great. Um, so I'm going to follow up with a, a bit more background, but now looking at the structural optimization side of things, that's really going to hopefully set the scene for, for some of the later presentations uh, in this, uh, this workshop. So first of all, start at the beginning. What do we mean by optimization? What's the, what's the, what's, what do we actually want to achieve? What's the main goal? Normally, we wanted to minimize things. So we could be wanting to minimize um, material along the lines of, uh, of what uh, Ian's been referring to, which has a knock-on effect on, on the embodied carbon. So that's clearly something that we need to do. Uh, it's clearly an imperative. Alternatively, uh, I guess what's been done in the past implicitly or explicitly, uh, we could we could minimize the cost. Uh, what what constraints are we working with? Um, well, there are basic structural constraints, so equilibrium and material strength constraints. But also, again, as Ian mentioned, we, we may uh, uh, be particularly interested also in constructability. Uh, there's no point in, in, in coming up with uh, structures which we can never build. So there's an imperative to, to, to take some account of that um, in the process as well, where we can. What are the key variables? Um, we could be just changing the, the size of, of elements, so using conventional structural configuration, just changing the sizes, cross-sectional areas uh, of members, or we could be uh, more um, ambitious and actually change the layout of the, uh, of the overall structure. And the latter really depends on when we're doing the optimization. So if, if we're able to to apply optimization right at the start of the process, then we can be more ambitious. So we can use tools like layout or topology optimization. Whereas if we wait until late in the process, then we're gonna be really constrained in what we can actually do. Probably we can only change the size of members. And if, we, if we're gonna deliver these sort of radical shifts, then we've gotta be ambitious. So the real focus of the, of, of the, the presentations today are gonna to be at this conceptual design stage. How can we rethink what the, the best form for a given uh, um, design problem might be. So focus on layout, um, just a, a little bit of um, sort of history, if you like. Um, it's been known for well over a century um, that, that layout uh, is significant. And uh, an Australian engineer called uh, Mitchell um, produced a, a really nice paper in 1904, which basically showed that orthogonal layouts of um, tension, tension and compressive elements give rise to, to minimum volume structures. So this is actually taken from his, his paper. 
and it might be difficult to see what's going on, but basically there's a, there's a load, vertical load down at C, mid-span, and then there's supports A and B, and then the rest of the, um, the, 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 bolt, the, the thick members are actually structure. And we've basically got uh, tension members and compression members intersecting at 90 degrees, giving rise to uh, the optimal structure. How much does it matter? This is a simple sort of example. We've got a, a conventional Pratt truss at the top there. Uh, I've got a normalized volume of one. If on the other hand, we, we choose an optimized layout, then we can reduce that volume by almost a factor of two for the same um, performance uh, requirements. And difference observable is that the, the tension and compression elements shown in, shown in blue and red are near orthogonal in this in this particular case so that that's what helps reduce the the volume of material required to produce this structure if we turn our attention to, to bridges um, this is a fantastic view of the firth of fourth now we've got uh, three long span bridges in that area um, but one observation is that the tension and compression elements at the top of these these pylons uh, both for the original um, suspension bridge, so the fourth road bridge, and the and the newer Queen's Free Crossing, those tension and compression elements are not orthogonal. So that indicates that there's potential for um, more efficient structures um, to, 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 to to span these span these um, um, these gaps. So how do we how do we do that computationally? Um, Topology optimization uh, is a widely used option. Basically what we do is we uh, have a design domain which we discretize using finite elements and effectively we, we, we use various algorithms to remove the low stress elements to reveal an optimum structure as you can see on the uh, on the slide there. Um, so increasingly accessible um, as I mentioned. Downside is it's Computationally expensive when you're dealing with large, sparse, or skeletal structures of the sort that we typically deal with, certainly in the field of long span bridges. Um, that's not to say it's, it has no uh, use. There's a very interesting bit of work uh, published last year by some Danish researchers who used uh, continuum topology optimization to basically identify um, optimized stiffeners in the, in the box girder. Uh, of the bridge. Um, downside is, I think it, I think they said it took uh, 16,000 CPU cores, 85 hours to deliver the, the outcome. So it's useful for a study, but not necessarily going to be usable or, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis for the foreseeable future at the conceptual design stage. So what we uh, have been focusing on at Sheffield for some years now is something called layout optimization. Um, basically picking up on a formulation that was uh, developed in the 60s by some American mathematicians, uh, Dawn and colleagues. Uh, basically, the, the formulation involves, first of all, discretizing, should I say, a design domain, not with finite elements, but with nodes. Um, we've got also the supports and loads there shown. We connect those nodes with potential connections, potential members. And then we use optimization to reveal the minimum volume truss structure, as you can see there. Now, if we are simply minimizing volume with stress constraints, the optimization problem is linear. So it means that we can solve that problem very, very quickly. And we can solve very large problems without any issue. The constraints involved are simply the material strength and equilibrium constraints, which I, I kind of showed pictorially a few slides ago. And we can also extend that formulation to, to cover other problems. For example, we can um, apply it to, to beam grillages as well. The downside is that uh, real world problems are, are not that simple. We have uh, you know, things like buckling, we have buildability constraints, we have catalog sections uh, and so forth. So what people have done in the sector very often is they've turned to what I've described here as meta heuristic methods. So you will have heard of things such as genetic algorithms, 
um, various other other nature inspired algorithms to, to, tr to try to find uh, uh, a solution to your problem. The downsides of those methods is they tend to be very computationally expensive once you have more than a few design variables. And also you tend to end up in a, in a local optima and you don't necessarily know where you are relative to the global optima. So to do things uh, a bit more quickly, we have uh, focused on this two-stage or two-step process that I've highlighted on the right, where we basically use that very simple approach to get a solution to the relaxed problem where not all the complexity is there. And then in the second step, we, we search out nearby locally optimal solution. And the nice thing about it is we, we can see how close we are from that initial global optimum to the um, to the local optimum that might be um, more practical. And we can be, be, be quite confident that we've got a good solution. So here's, here's a, a very simple example. I've got um, a cantilever truss with a couple of loads. We apply load optimization. We end up with a solution, something like the one you can see. It's a little bit messy. Um, in the second step, we can, we can rationalize a solution that actually involves changing to a non-linear optimization where we're moving the nodes around now or the joints uh, to give a much cleaner solution. And then if we think there's too many members in that solution, we can actually minimize the number of members subject to some predefined um, um, penalty on the volume. So we might say, we're happy for the volume to increase by 10%, show me the solution that, 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 that has the fewest member members in it for a 10% um, impact on, on volume. Here's some uh, simple examples. Um, this is actually from a, a paper that was published uh, last month in the Structural Multidisciplinary Optimization Journal, which is, is freely available. And it basically makes use of uh, the layopt truss web app, which has been around for about a year or so. Um, on the left, uh, you can see how you can uh, uh, visualize what the uh, impact of changing the support conditions are. So we basically, as we go down on the left, we have increasing restraint from the boundaries. On the right-hand side, we've got some, some more bridge-like problems where we start at the top with high compressive strength in relation to tensile, tensile strength. And then we change that. Uh, uh, so at the bottom, uh, see the way around, we've got high tensile strength and low compressive strength. And you can see how you can naturally transition from an arch structure to a cable stayed bridge structure at the bottom. So um, lots of fun and uh, an adapted version of this is gonna be a subject of uh, um, a later talk today. Now, lots of other considerations I haven't had time to, uh, to cover. Uh, multiple load cases can be dealt with very uh, easily in this formulation. Global stability, a little bit more difficult, but there are the formulations available. Complexity, um, various different algorithms to deal with that. Um, and lastly, on this list, self-weight, which is clearly very, very important when it comes to long term bridges, as Ian's already mentioned. And so that's going to be the subject of the next presentation that uh, is gonna be delivered by uh, Helen. Okay, thank you very much, Matthew. So yes, as Matthew said today, I'm gonna to be talking about layout optimization. Doesn't seem to want to go back, Tom. Could you go back a slide? Yeah. So uh, this graph has already been shown by Ian, but this just really highlights the importance of self-weight when we're looking at long spans. Um, so you can see that, for example, the Messina bridge with its span of around three kilometers would already be having the cable load, so the cable's own self-weight as the dominant cause of force in the cable. So clearly it's important that we can accurately model this for the purposes of our optimization algorithms. So 
if we consider, as Matthew's mentioned, we use a trust layout optimization method, which involves discretizing the domain into a, using a series of nodes and collect, connecting each of those with straight potential bar members. So if we consider for a moment just a single bar, just to drill down into what's happening, the reality, of course, is that if we have a prismatic bar, the weight of that bar is evenly distributed along its length and we can find the total if we know the unit weight of the material and the cross-sectional area and of course the bar length. Now a fairly intuitive and standard way to model this uh, would be to just assume that we can effectively lump this to the two ends of the bar as shown here. So we just add up that total weight divide it by two and apply it to the two ends. However, of course, these two diagrams aren't quite equivalent. The distributed load on the left is gonna be causing some bending in that bar and we're neglecting this in this lump mass simplification on the right. Now, in general, if we're modeling something with a known layout, then there's ways we can address this. We could maybe subdivide that into smaller elements. However, because we're optimizing, we don't know this layout in advance and we can't control it in quite that way. Um, and this leads us to have issues. And these are further compounded by the fact that the area is set by the optimizer and it's based on the axial force and whatever stress we have allowed to ensure that the axial force is gonna fully load and make full use of that bar. But of course, this extra bending is then going to increase that stress further and it's going to be violating the permitted stress that we've set. And in the optimization algorithms, this also tends to be self reinforcing. So, because it's advantageous to the optimizer to be able to effectively magically move the weight to the endpoints, it favors that and we get solutions which artificially have very long bars and therefore a very high level of error from this. So instead, some work that we started at Sheffield uh, a couple of years ago was to look at if we can replace these straight bars instead with these forms called an equal stress catenary. And this is a shape that's where the definition of it is that it must have axial stresses all along its length um, under this combined action of a given axial load and the self-weight, and also that those axial stresses should be of the same magnitude. So a couple of examples are shown on the right. As you can see, they have curved center lines. And if the force is in compression, that curve is a sort of arching sense. If the axial force is in tension, the curve is a sort of sagging sense. And they also vary slightly in cross section. Um, however, for realistic numbers, even for very long spans, um, that would be the difference in cross section is very unnoticeable. But for context, with a reasonably high strength steel, the width between the two dotted lines here is somewhere in the order of 20 kilometers. So you can see we're only really taking small slices of this, but it's enough to overcome the errors that I mentioned in the previous slide. So We've used these catenaries instead of the straight bars in the procedure that Matthew outlined just now. And we have obtained some results here for a multiple span bridge. So effectively an infinite number of spans or certainly a very large number of spans and with varying span lengths subject to their own self weight and a uniform load along the deck. And you can see here we have the optimal structure in H. And then we also have two simplified versions of the optimal structure. So these were manually produced, but to sort of take away a small amount of the difficulties you can see in H, rationalizing it to just have two or three spokes coming out from that support. And you can see the, the volumes there are relatively close to the optimal. And then for comparison purposes, we have some more familiar designs. Um, some cable stayed type forms and some suspension type forms, as well as some of the perhaps more practical designs where we've limited the height to the sort of range that you'd usually see. And you can see that 
for A, for example, a suspension bridge with a sort of realistic span to dip ratio, we're actually we're getting quite close to that point where the volume really takes off. Similar to that graph that Ian showed, where it's exponentially increasing to the point where it's just not possible anymore. Um, there's a number of other parametric studies related to this available in the paper, um, including pylon height and so on. But the main drawback of all of these results is that we only had that single load case uniformly all along the deck. And as Ian mentioned at the end of his talk, an uneven load on two adjacent spans is going to be causing bending and none of these are, are designed to resist that. So if we consider different load cases, and again, I'm going to briefly go back to talking about a single element. So a single one of these catenary elements for now, what happens if we reduce the force on it? So a tension force where we have our sort of sagging cable. Often, if it's a cable sort of diameters, et cetera, realistic sort of numbers, we usually find that a new equilibrium is possible. Of course, the final designs would have to be checked for large deformation, et cetera, in the detailed design stage. But for the purposes of conceptual design, it's usually possible. However, for compressive forces, there's all sorts of very severe problems, snap through buckling, for example, um, which make it quite unmanageable. So these catenary type elements, when there's multiple load cases that are significant, uh, we would say that they're generally not suitable for use for compressive elements. And we would just use them for a table type tension element. Instead, we have a slightly different model. Um, and instead of eliminating bending, as we have done with the catenaries, we're going to design our elements to be able to resist the bending. So they have some bending strength. And in the tools that we're going to be showing later, there are two different forms of the, this model. One is to have the joints between elements rigid, and we ensure that there is moment equilibrium there in addition to the normal force equilibrium that we would be imposing. This has an impact on the computational difficulty, but also means that we can get the truly lower material usage. However, in general, bending is not the most efficient way to carry a force. So in a lot of cases, actually, we're not getting that much benefit for our extra computational cost. And so it might be more useful to just assume that the joints are pinned. And this means that we can have the same number of variables and constraints. And in general, the computational difficulty is very similar to the standard layer optimization method before we have self-weight. And yes, there's a small chance that we might not have the absolute minimum, but in general, it's less than 1%. So it's usually a worthwhile trade-off. Uh, can also use this one more easily in 3D, and I'll come back to that later. So we would usually recommend for our models that we use a combination of those two approaches. So we have some cable elements, and these are using the catenary model only allowing tensile forces, and the permitted stress here is 500 megapascals. And then the beam elements, where we're allowing a lower stress level, but that can be intention or compression. So the pylon type areas here are made of the beam material, whilst the cable hangers here and the ties across the top would be made of the cable material. Um, so this example has just a single load case with the uniform load, just for comparison. But you can see again how we've got these diagonal pylons and they're bringing those angles between the tension and compression members much closer to 90 degrees. Of course, if we ran this with very high detail, we'd have even more diagonals and the angles would be even closer. But of course, that has a trade off in terms of actual buildability. So if we now add a second load case to this, so if we assume that, as Ian was mentioning, one span is going to be the left span, say, is going to have the live load and the dead load, and the right span is going to have the dead load only. And then we also have a third load case, which is the same but reversed. And here we find that the optimal structure has added these ties. So rather than adding bending stiffness to the pylon, as Ian suggested, 
another option which the optimizer has preferred is to have tie the tops directly back to the end point to the end pylons where they're then tied down to the supports on the back spans here so as i mentioned 3d problems we can use the catenary model and the pin beam model in 3d we have slightly more difficulty using the rigid beam model just in terms of the extra sort of torsion calculations and the influence of sort of spinning the beams into different orientations. But we have here a problem based on a sort of stadium roof type of thing. And Tom will be showing you in more detail in the second half how you can use our tools to create the problem like this. Um, and here we have two versions, one with a relatively lightweight material, where you can see it's quite a truss type thing, and it's got no real problem with having a fairly chunky compression ring here in the centre floating over the middle of the stadium. And then as the material is heavier, here we've not changed the relative tension and compression strength. This is just changing the weight of the material. Um, you can see it becomes preferable to move that compression ring out to the outside directly over the supports, even though it's of course a larger diameter circle. The fact that you don't have to carry the weight of that material makes that preferable in the cases when the self weight becomes more significant. So you can see it can make a really major difference to the overall forms that you're finding here. So, this is, that was an introduction to the basic methods, and I'm now going to very briefly introduce two new tools that we are announcing today, um, which implement these methods. And then we'll have a short comfort break, and then we will go into more detail about actually how to use each of these in the second half. So we have two new tools which we are announcing. Uh, the first is Layup Bridge, and this is a new version of the Layup web app, which some of you may have seen and which Matthew mentioned earlier, which requires no installation. It's just a browser based interface. It's very quick to pick up, just but it's a little bit limited in terms of it can only do 2D problems and there's certain limitations on number of load cases, etc. For more complex problems, then we are also releasing a new version of Peregrine version six, and this is a plugin for the Rhino Grasshopper. Um, ecosystem and this can handle complex problems you've of course got the very powerful rhino and grasshopper tools to create your geometry and this can also work in three-dimensional problems so layout bridge is more of um it's slightly more than an educational tool but it certainly is very valuable from an educational perspective um, for example as the animation at the bottom shows it can show the stages of the solution progress progress in real time uh, and that can be really valuable for understanding what's happening and why it's happening um, it's also of course very quick and easy to get started and it's easy to share problems with your co-workers or on social media so it's good for starting a discussion about an interesting problem that you may have found as well and peregrine as i mentioned is more suited to the slightly more complex problems um, in 2D and 3D. And there's also a lot of features in Peregrine that go beyond the self-weight and long span specialism that we're discussing today. So for example, grillage optimization of beams across a floor plate, for example, um, a lot of powerful simplification tools, um, stability type problems, and much more. So Layout Bridge is launching today. Uh, it's simple as visiting that web link there. Uh, and we will be yeah, giving you some time to get hands on with that in the second part of this session. And Peregrine, the new version of Peregrine is going to be released this time next week. So Thursday, the 7th of October. And that's on the Food for Rhino website, which is the usual place for downloading Grasshopper and Rhino plugins. And um, yes, that will version six will be available next Thursday. Um, if you go there now, you will, of course, see the earlier versions, which don't necessarily include all the features that we're talking about today. So I think now we're going to have a brief comfort break. Uh, yeah. 
and then yeah. Yeah, thanks Alan yeah so uh, I think we're running pretty much uh, to time so we'll take a, a, a break until um, 1650 just to give you time to stretch your legs get away from the screen for a few minutes and then opportunity to see a bit more about uh, of these uh, two new tools that Helen's mentioned so see you shortly all right welcome back everyone um gonna start now with the the second part of the session with uh, a demonstration of the peregrine plugin uh, that's going to be delivered by tom pritchard so fight tom to uh take over now and uh, and uh, hopefully uh, explain uh, what's involved in, in creating and uh, and solving a, a problem. Thanks, Matthew. So yeah, we're going to take a quick look at structural optimization using Peregrine version six in Grasshopper. Um, that's just me. Um, the contents is just going to be, I'm going to go over a little bit about what Peregrine is, what we've added in V6 with a specific sort of um, bent towards long span structures. And then if we've got time, I'm going to try and get through three examples relatively quickly. Uh, the staging roof that Helen mentioned previously, and then also um, a long span bridge and a, a valley crossing. So two slightly different types of um, bridge problems, and then just sum it all up at the end. So the first thing is what is Peregrine? So it's a structural layout optimization tool within Grasshopper Rhino environment um, that allows you to undertake parametric modeling. And it's a very powerful conceptual structural design tool with applications both um, in structural engineering and also um, in the design for additive manufacturers sectors. But obviously we're talking um, here about the structural engineering side of it. Um, and people that's been involved um, sort of at limit state um, and also input from Arup and Sheffield. And the workflow that the software uses is basically defining the problem um, in terms of the design domain, the materials, the loading and the support that you're providing to it, and then optimizing and then undertaking post-processing in order to do the rationalization and the simplification um, that have been mentioned in the previous talks and then getting the output um, within the Rhino environment. There's quick um, recent use cases. So um, it's been used in sort of real life as well as conceptually um, to build um, designs for a cable gantry and also in additive manufacture for um, a large metal um, printed truss structure, as you can see on the right there. What's new in version six, obviously we've been talking about this enhanced self-weight modeling, um, which allows us to do bridge design optimization. Um, additionally, adding in the ability to deal with multiple domains. So that facilitates, um, again, this bridge design optimization, global stabilization, and also as Helen touched on previously, the beam, gr the beam grillage optimization. So allowing sort of holistic building design optimization to take place. So if we jump straight into the examples, if you bear with me, I will open up Rhino on my thing. So we have the, the grasshopper environment here, and also I'll make that a little smaller for now. We can see that we have on the screen here um, an overview of how Peregrine works, I guess. Um, so working from left to right, we have the geometry um, that has been defined and that plugs in along with some supports and loading into a design domain, which then also we plug into a problem specification. If I zoom in a little bit, you can see here we're combining domains, load cases and various other settings. And then that moves into the optimization stage. At the moment, that's not turned on. And then we can go into post-processing and then displaying. And the um, toolbar at the top of the screen is 
organized in a very similar sort of workflow so you can sort of look from left to right so this is the first example which is this stadium roof that we're looking at and if i scroll back to the left hand side here we can see that this deals with the geometry of the problem and that's reflected in the um, viewport at the bottom here so we can change things quite easily like the radius if i make that sort of 200 250 then the size of our problem changes. Similarly, with the height, I can boost that up to 80, 100. And you can see that very quickly, I mean, there's a slight lag because of the uh, internet connection, but we're getting almost immediate changes to the problem geometry. Similarly, we can change things like the whole size, um, anything that we can describe parametrically within our problem, we can adjust as necessary through this environment. So you can see the problem on the screen. We have this wedge shape here, the green one, which is our design domain. We have support surfaces. So this plane here on the left-hand side is supported um, normal to that direction. And also there's vertical support on the outside. And we have line loading along this line here. And what we're gonna do is optimize that problem um, and then create an array around our circle so effectively sort of mirroring it in this case 20 times around there and you can see obviously that the link nature of the problem setup means that other components will update alongside the changes um, and as the loading expands and contracts accordingly so let's get on and solve the problem i think i'm going to make the radius slightly larger because we're dealing with long span structures and similarly we'll make the height 100 we'll keep the ratio of the whole size about the same and you can see that there and if i scroll over here we can see here we have a material with a tensile stress of 250 megapascals and a compression to tension ratio of one at the moment. So effectively, we're saying that we have the same value of stress in or limiting stress in both compression and in tension. But I'll get on and solve the problem. And you see it ran through very quickly and we are coming up with this structure, which I'll make a little bit larger. So we can see, so it's, it's similar to the one that Helen was showing where we have this compression ring on the inside and then a structure that is then taking the forces back to the outside to the supporting structure at the edges. And the volume of that we can see is 9.82 times 10 to the 12. Uh, so we can sort of, um, take that into consideration later so the next thing we want to do is look at it and think actually we're not considering gravity in this particular case so if i scroll back to the left hand side here you can see one of the things that we can do is actually turn on the consideration of gravity so i turn that to true and very quickly it's again gone through the stages of the layout optimization and also a geometry optimization afterwards and the optimum structure is now quite different. The material has been pushed outwards towards the supports. And if we move over here, we can see in this case, the volume has actually gone up by quite a considerable amount. It's gone up to 7.5 times 10 to the 13. So almost um, doubling the weight of the structure by considering the gravity in it. Another thing we can do is increase the number of nodal divisions. So if I say, okay, actually I want to have a slightly more refined nodal layout um, and find a different structure, we can do that. And you can see now that these cantilevers have become slightly more complex and the structure around the outside has actually remained much the same. Um, but another aspect that we might want to investigate, especially relevant for these long span structures, is the use of 
Katina is to carry the tension. And we can see here at the bottom that I've actually created um, a material with a catenary self-weight model and provided it with a tensile stress of 500 megapascals, but no ability to carry compression at all. And in order to consider that as well as the original beam type structures, um, all I have to do is connect up that material into our design domain. And you can see that it's actually running through again. And we've come up with a solution that's again, quite different. So we've got arch structures with this sort of cable type structure within it, um, carrying the load and our volume here has actually decreased because the um, amount of force that's being taken by the catenary um, is greater than obviously it was previously. So we'll go on to a different problem. So if I close this one, if you bear with me. Uh, I will open that. So this problem we're looking at now is actually a half span um, of a much longer cable stayed bridge and it's across a body of water and we can have multiple load cases in this. So what we're saying here is line loading, which is representative of our dead loading and then traffic loading on top of that. And they're both shown here, the line loading for the dead load and then the traffic load actually at the center of the span. And if I go to solve that, it takes a little while to go through and because it's slightly more complex, we've got the geometry optimization going on, then um, that's going to run through. But you see, Within sort of um, 10, 20 seconds, we've come up with the cable stage structure, um, very similar to the ones like Helen was showing earlier with this tree um, in the middle that's supported by the tension structure between it and with the cables going down to the deck. Um, but what if the supports are further apart, we can potentially move them apart, you can see it's solving behind the scenes. So now what we're going to actually do is have um, two supports rather than one in the middle. And hopefully once the geometry optimizations run through, what we'll see is actually quite an interesting change of structure. Okay, so it's taking a little while to complete the geometry optimization stage of it, but hopefully it won't be too long. Okay, so it's done and should update. Yep, so now we can see what we've got is this structure where the support positions have been moved apart from each other. And we have the usual cable stay, but this central part of it is then supported from another um, cable mechanism between the tops of the two towers um, into the middle. And obviously um, the practicalities of building structures like this have been um, discussed by Ian, but it's something that we can use as a conceptual design tool and use to stimulate conversation about what may or may not be um, possible for our optimizations. I'm conscious that time's going on. So what I'll do is I'll just jump back into the presentation summarize. So what we've seen is that um, Peregrine for long span structural optimization can help us rapidly identify these highly efficient topologies. Um, it has applications in both frame and long span structural design, and it's a valuable tool for working out conceptual designs. And um, there's more information about the software at limitstate.com slash peregrine. And as Helen mentioned previously, version six of the software is going to be released sort of this time next week on the 7th of October, and you can download that via Food for Rhino. So what I'll do is I'll just pass back over now to Helen, who's going to talk about the um, hands-on session. Okay, thank you, Tom. So, yes, I'm now going to do a quick demonstration of Layout Bridge. 
So I think Tom is going to move just a normal browser window over onto this screen. And what you see here is when you first visit the website, which is at layup.com slash bridge, um, you, this is what you are presented with, just a simple sort of startup problem. Uh, this is similar to the example that Tom didn't actually end up getting to, but he did mention with the valley crossing. And you've, so you can see here, we've got similar to Peregrine, a design domain that's filled here. And it's got some areas where structures not permitted, this whole section here, and some gray areas where the structure is not permitted, but there is support available. So effectively that's the land the, or the ground. Um, and then in Layout Bridge, the loading is a little more restricted, but easier to get started with than in Peregrine. So we have this gray thick line here that represents the line of the bridge deck. So the line along which the loading is applied. And then the green areas represent the loads themselves. So in this case, it's a single, a uniform load across the whole deck. Now interacting with this is very simple. So we simply mouse over to change the geometry, mouse over one of these black circles and we can drag them around like so and the structure automatically updates um, and resolves. And as you can see, it's showing the stages of the process as it goes. So as Matthew mentioned, we start with the layer optimization and then we use the geometry optimization where we're moving the nodes around. Uh, we can also change several parameters. So for example, we can sort of zoom the entire screen. So currently this dimension is to have a deck length of 800 meters. If we drag that up to say around there, so a two kilometers Spanish, you can see that the forms change quite significantly. Similarly to the stadium examples, we've now pushed more of the structure out to the side, but maybe we decide that we don't like all this underslung structure in the middle here. So we can change the geometry, add another vertex to this hole and just pull it up and prevent it from doing quite so much of that. And of course there's infinite flexibility here. We could add longer backspans or many other things. Um, and to get you started with different types of bridge, there's a number of examples which are available in this menu at the top here. So we can go to load example. Um, just confirm that you want to move away from the problem you're currently looking at. And here we have various different examples, different structural types, arches and more cable stayed types forms. Now, some of these images you'll notice have a line vertically down them. Um, and these are the ones that have symmetry enforced. So they're ones where we want to address a symmetrical problem and some of them such as this one don't. So I'm going to show you a symmetrical example now, so this one. Um, and again, as you click on it, it shows you the stages of the solving process. And because this problem has symmetry enforced, whenever we make a change, it will make the change to both sides. So if I was to, for example, drag the supports in, effectively making the span shorter. It's happened on both sides of the domain simultaneously. Now it goes back to where they started. However, that doesn't mean that we can only address symmetrical loading conditions. So the loads in Layopt are controlled from this section here, it's entitled loads. And you can see from this top section, the enabled load cases one and two load cases one and two are both enabled. So if we click on the bottom boxes to view those load cases, so as we click on that, the structure changes to show us the utilization of each bar or each member in that load case. So we have here red uh, cables or red elements are in tension and blue elements in compression. Uh, and then we have some gray at the top here and those are the members which aren't being used in this load case. So this load case being a uniform load with just the dead load across the whole span. And the second load case that's enabled in this example, we can change to viewing here. You can see this one has a higher load on this left side span um, and the lower load on the right. And as we've changed this, the forces and the colors have updated to show us the forces in this load case. So you can see now that 
these additional ties are, she, are utilized to carry that extra load back over to this support over here. Um, so we don't need to explicitly say that we want to also consider the opposite load case. So the load case where the right hand span has a higher load um, that's taken, that's dealt with implicitly. You can see, of course, that we have these tie cables on the left. So if we were to evaluate it for that reversed load case, those tie cables at the top of the left hand span would be the ones being utilized. So we can also obviously turn these load cases on and off simply. So if we turn off the second load case, it solves again. And you can see as the example, the rendered version I showed you earlier, we now don't have the cable ties across the top. We just have this sort of single split pylon cable stayed type bridge structure. Again, showing the nice near orthogonal tension and compression members. Okay, I'm gonna try one more example. So we'll look at a slightly different one. We'll have a look at an arch type example. So again, this one has symmetry enforced. Um, and this one also defaults to having this simplification on. And I'm just going to turn this off first to show you what the structure is initially. So this is just completing the geometry optimization stage now. And you can see the nodes moving towards their optimal positions. And you can see we've got sort of a significant outer arch, but then also these ribs going up the inside. Again, these are helping to keep the tension and compression members orthogonal or near orthogonal um, and reducing the volume, but they're probably not really completely sort of making enough use to justify how much more difficult they might be to construct. So one of the post-processing steps, which is available in the Layopt uh, app, Layopt Bridge app, is this simplify. So this is a post-processing step where we change the optimization around. So instead of minimizing the volume, we start from our structure and we say we want to minimize the number of members and we have the tolerance for how much we'd like to add in terms of volume. So again, it starts with the same process of the layout optimization and then the geometry optimization, but then it will do an extra stage on the end where we're looking to try and get rid of whichever members are the least useful, whichever members are going to cause the least overall increase in the weight of the structure. So in that case, it's now completed that bit. And then it further just refines the positions of the nodes because the optimal positions usually will have changed somewhat once we've removed some of those smaller members. So you can see that the simplified solution looks like this. And in this top left-hand corner, we can see some statistics for the structure. So we can see the tonnage in total and for the beams in turquoise and the cables in orange separately. And then we can also see that overall, the simplification actually added just under 1% to the volume. So that's probably gonna be sort of a good structure in terms of overall usefulness once we're thinking about including those sort of buildability concerns, et cetera. So for this one, if we have a look at what it will be with a secondary load case, so I'm gonna take the simplification off just to, so it's clear what we're seeing. I'm gonna add a second load case where we've got a half span that's got some extra loading. And you can see it's solving here like this. It's quite complicated. So just to speed things up, I'm going to reduce the res nodal resolution of the layout optimization stage. So we do that here. So the grid you can see not only affects your snapping for the geometry of your problem, but also is used as the setup for layout optimization and we can make it coarser or finer. And you see it solves with the nodes on the intersection points there before they start moving in geometry optimization. So here you can see once we've got the pattern loading on the arch, we get this sort of network arch type structure. Again, this one is slightly clearer to see if we untick 
all of the boxes in the view load case row because it's then colored by material and you can see it actually appears symmetrical whereas it doesn't necessarily when you're looking at the forces and here we can see that we've got quite a few spindly members sort of tracing that arch um, so a lot of that is caused by the fact that we're using the pinned beam members so as i mentioned earlier when we talk when we're thinking about using beams to carry self-weight we've got the pin beams which are more computationally efficient but potentially structurally not quite as good and we can actually use but either one in layup so we can go to the materials menu and we can show more details and we can have a look at changing those beams over to use the rigid joints and it will solve this again with the different structural values there of course you can see in this that there's also a lot of other parameters you can control strengths weights um, of both the beam material and the cable material but here you can see that it's now almost finished solving the geometry optimization stage and because it's got that bending resistance built in it's the structure is already quite a lot simpler without the sort of little extra members so the final feature that i'm just want to show quickly is how you can share these structures that you created here so in this menu again there's a number of ways you can share them so you can download um, as either vector or raster images and also as an animation that will show all the stages of the solution you can also download it as a file to your computer to open again later or you can share it as a link so if you click on that you get a version of the structure a uh, version of the address sorry with a sort of id number at the end and you can copy that and paste it however you like share it with other people and they can just click on that link and see your structure so we're now going to give you um, a bit of time to play and explore the layout bridge um, so if tom could switch back to the powerpoint screen so yeah, we're going to give you around about five minutes to have a look at that. If you find anything particularly interesting, then we'd love it if you'd put the link, that shareable link into the chat and we can maybe sh share them with people. Um, otherwise, if you've got any other general questions, do put them into the Q&A section. And we will start back with Dan's presentation at 22 in five minutes time so at 22 minutes past and in the meantime we will have a little look to see if there's any questions in the Q&A section that need answering. Thanks Helen I, I can see a question um, that's going to be right up your street uh, so Itamar says is much lost due to the fact that the simplification is in the post-processing stage rather than simultaneously optimized and then he, he and saying the benefit in computational efficiency is clear. So how, how much how how much more optimal would it be if we did the whole thing in one go, I guess is the question. So we can, of course, only really check this for um, quite simple cases, because as you say, Itamar, the benefit in computational efficiency is huge. But actually, in a lot of the cases where we have got a result from a simultaneous um, simplification and optimization, we actually find that we can get the same solutions, um, even in cases where it's not, it's normally very small. Yeah, so I mean, Helen has, um, has spent some time using um, yeah, mixed interlinear programming. Um, and yeah, it, it, it does take a long, a long time to get those solutions that you that you showed uh, in in the paper on that, Helen. Yeah. Um, uh, there's an, another question here. Um, does Layout have moving load analysis? So I've, I guess um, that's from uh, Shebaz. Um, the answer is, uh, I, I guess you're referring to layout bridge. So layout bridge, we haven't haven't 
added any any sort of functionality to that effect. It's really there as a sort of exploratory tool for you to uh, um, get first order solutions um, to the problem, uh, you know, to, to, to basic problems. So you, you could have one load case with just, just uniform loading everywhere or patch loading, but, but certainly there is no functionality for, for moving load. I think I showed in my talk um, the transition from conceptual design to detailed design. And I think that's the sort of thing that uh, when you get into, into more detailed um, parts of the design process, you would obviously do those sort of studies, but you do those uh, having already done the sort of conceptual design that Helen's referred to. Um, any, so hopefully you've all seen the, the link that I've shared in the chat. Um, to the Bridge web app, and you're all having fun. If you do uh, have any uh, interesting problems to share, then as Helen says, please, please, please go ahead and share them. Um, also, if you do have any um, questions um, for any of the, uh, the participants, then now's a good time uh, while others, others are busy. Um, hopefully having fun with the, the web app. Uh, to ask those questions. No, everything was very, very clear. <laughs> ah. I can thoroughly recommend having a play with the web app. It's a lot of fun for any, any bridge engineer. Yeah. Dan, Dan's shortly going to show the fruits of his uh, of his labour. Um, we'll just give it one more minute, and then we'll we'll hand over to Dan to uh, um, allow him to share um, some of his experience. And if you do have any, I mentioned um, sharing uh, links. That's great. If you do have any problems or any issues, then then very very useful for you to share those as well. Clearly, it's uh, it's brand new. You're the first humans outside the, the narrow circle of the uh, research project to actually experience it, uh, and uh, yeah, so I'd be very, very keen to know uh, how you get on, and what you find it useful for, and what you find it frustratingly not useful for. Okay, I think um, I will now um, hand over to um, Dan, who's going to talk about uh, application of some of these tools in practice. So take it away, Dan. Thanks a lot, Matthew. I believe I've got control. I think. There we go. Okay, let's ignore that one. Yes, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dan Green. I'm a principal uh, bridge engineer at, at Covey UK, um, and it's sort of my job now to bookend this uh, this presentation after almost one and a half hours now of really interesting, um, fascinating um, reporting from from uh, the guys at Sheffield about what they've been doing, um, and sort of turn our thoughts back towards um, how we might apply these these tools IRL in real life in a design office. Um, so I'm a practicing design engineer, typically involved in at the uh, sort of technical deep end of, of projects. Um, I'm sure there are many others on this call who are similar. Um, and my experience of, of major infrastructure projects, the types of the way we might be really concerned about optimization um, for material efficiency, is that you know, as an engineer, we spend a little bit of time on site and we spend a lot of time doing our work in front of a computer screen tapping away. But then actually the majority of the time that we spend um, you know, uh, progressing these projects is actually spent managing and navigating the project environment. The design and decision-making process in a project environment as opposed to a sort of an academic one um, is dictated by the sort of interactions between you know, diverse teams of professionals with different competencies and priorities. And, and the optimization processes that we want to use because we think they are valuable have to fit into that environment. Um, I've had experience of trying to introduce these sorts of new workflows into 
into the design office before and I know it's complex and hard sometimes um, and I've also seen sort of specialist optimization teams falter in this kind of environment attempting to sort of solve bridge engineering um, in its entirety and kind of wasting months inappropriately design, uh, simplifying design codes and producing unbuildable designs um, by which time the design has been frozen and moved on anyway. Um, so the question is, from my perspective, what do we really need from an optimization tool? Um, so if it's to be a success, in, in, in my view, an optimization workflow should be um, firstly a fast one. It, it's got to be used in conceptual design as, been, as it's been identified by, by many of the speakers already. Um, uh, program is critical for, for real designers, not just contractors. Um, we need to be able to move from setting up our original initial constraints to an answer that gives us real insight um, quickly. Um, and if we don't, the easy or the known solution will be selected by default. Um, it also needs to be easy to communicate. Um, uh, we're often in this sort of situation presenting an unusual solution. Um, and if we aren't able to communi communicate and convince our team, our managers and clients that, that this solution has merit, um, without alienating anyone, um, then it's fairly useless um, at the end of the day. And the final thing is that um, any optimization tool has to be focused in a realistic context. Um, Decision-making on large projects is compartmentalized. And, and while the idea of a sort of holistic optimization routine that takes in a huge number of variables and, and, and uh, yeah, a huge number of variables is, is alluring, it can be counterproductive if it in, involves stagnating the decision-making pro pro process. So it's good to keep the task contained and focused. So basically with that in mind, I, I sort of picked up the Layup Bridge app when it was available um, and applied it to, to some of the projects that I've been involved in over the years to sort of get a better understanding of how it might be deployed in the answers and the uh, interesting ideas it might spark. These aren't sort of super long span examples, but then um, there aren't many of the super long span examples around in the world. So maybe it's more applicable to the sort of common projects that people see. So the first project I tried it out on um, was this three tower cable state bridge. Um, it's about a kilometer long that was involved with about seven years ago now. Um, it's a concrete deck with concrete pylons. Um, the two outer pylons are taller, the middle one is shorter. Um, so I put in various rough values for the dead, dead and live loads in the web app. Um, set up the initial constraints, hit solve. Um, it went through the various steps that have already been <laughs> outlined and I basically stopped it as soon as I could see the important results starting to emerge. Um, and I, I appreciate it looks like a little bit of a mess, um, but it is suggesting um, something like a 50% reduction in the material required for the, the pylons, the substructure, the supporting structure. Um, and there are some interesting features emerging that we can see straight away. One of the things that you're able to do with this kind of tool is, is input the actual constraints rather than having to fix them in your own mind first. So um, what I've put in a, at the base is the um, the foundation zones that are allowed by the client rather than specific foundation support points, which um, uh, were assumed in, in the uh, in initial concept design. Um, and you can see that the optimized solution is really making use of all of that space. And it's effectively split the two taller pylons into uh, two different structures, um, a shorter pylon on the inside of that zone, and then a, a sort of arch support uh, for the side span on the outside of that zone. Um, we also now have three pylons of relatively balanced height, uh, unlike before. Um, and, and we have these sort of hybrid tide arch cable stayed end spans, which are approximately 180 meters long, so not entirely implausible. Um, and we also have this feature that's been referred to a number of times before popping up again, which is the, uh, uh, the uh, ties between the pile and tops, um, which you commonly see on these multi-span optimization solutions if you have uh, asymmetric load cases applied, which we do in this case. Um, and that's fairly viable for equal height pylons. So from my perspective, this is an interesting, an eminently interesting and useful result. Um, if I'm in the concept design team, um, looking at various diff different options. Um, I would want maybe not this option, but something derived from this option to be on the whiteboard. And, and while I might not advocate for it to be the final solution, 
Um, at the very least, they'll be looking to benchmark quantities from this solution against the other ones that we're proposing as we go along. Um, and then the next project I thought I'd show is uh, the elevation you can see at the top there is of a structure that, that might be familiar to some people if, if you pay attention to bridge engineering. Um, it was never built, but fully designed. This is a, a sort of haunched um, three span beam planned to cross the River Thames carrying quite a lot of soil. Um, I worked on the detailed design of this and, and the most sort of distinct, distinctive feature was a sort of corrugated soffit um, fabricated from plate steel, which splayed out radially from the piers, and you can kind of see that in the elevation. That was an architectural decision, but it also uh, was a structural piece of material. Um, we knew that there were inefficiencies for this structure coming from two sources, really, the constraints on the overall form, so no structure above the bridge deck, um, which dictated this sort of slender beam but also the complex form of that soffit, um, which interrupted the kind of direct load path you'd be expecting uh, along the, the soffit of the structure. Um, so in this case, what I first chose to do was to, to optimize within those height constraints that we were given to try and tease out whether we were anywhere near uh, a reasonable solution in the first place. I put in a really healthy allowance for uh, kind of dead loads for secondary steel works. We knew we needed a lot of that anyway in this structure because we had an unusual deck. Um, but even given this, the optimum solution that it's come up with here, so optimized solution one, is suggesting that something like 80% of the primary load carrying steel in, 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 our, in our solution was not necessary. And I would take that with a pinch of salt, but um, uh, the, the implication being really that, that the, uh, the corrugated soffit kind of structure was not uh, at all optimal for transferring loads in any direct way through the structure. Um, I then took the height constraint off and solved again, um, and you get these uh, these uh, sort of uh, Mitchell tr truss type structures coming up again, and you get these um, uh, near orthogonal angles as we've discussed before. Um, but the sort of reduction in in optimized steel load for this solution um, was about 50% as opposed to the previous one. Uh, and I thought what was interesting coming from that was that um, really most of, the, most of the benefit that we'd be looking for in terms of optimizing could have been achieved, achieved simply by rationalizing that soffit rather than going for um, uh, a change in the constraints. And I think this is um, Interesting, because I don't think that was a, an obvious uh, solution for us at the time when we were designing it. Um, and also, um, it's interesting doubly, actually, because we'd originally proposed a solution for this structure, which had a conventional internal box girder supporting a sort of flimsy architectural skin uh, in the early stages of the project, which would have provided a more direct load path um, than, the, than the software that we used. And I remember the contractor, who was our client, rejecting that solution on, on the sort of qualitative grounds that they didn't want to build a box inside a box and they thought this was extra fabrication work. Um, uh, but if we'd had this tool at the time, perhaps we'd have been able to mount an argument for why what we were trying to do was the right thing. Um, so maybe if we just take a step back and try and extract something from that uh, sort of whimsical exercise, um, what do these examples tell us? Well, I think firstly, from my perspective, the web app certainly delivers on the sort of three key features that I'd be looking for if I actually wanted to use an optimization tool in practice. Um, it's really fast to use. If you've been playing around with it in the last few minutes, you'll have noticed that it's dead easy to set up. Those couple of examples only took a few hours to run. Um, and that was because I had spent most of the time looking for the, um, the information. Um, it's really easy to put it up on the screen and communicate and discuss the output is, simple and, and suitably imprecise for the kind of work that we should be using it for. Um, and it's conveyed in, in a sort of visual language that all structural engineers are going to immediately grasp as well. And I think lastly, it's it's focused as well um, on bridge design in this case and on material quantities, uh, nothing else. Uh, what it does, it does convincingly. Um, and the loading patterns that are being modeled are, are plausible and relevant. Um, and with the introduction of these catenary elements, as opposed to the previous version of the um, of layopt, um, uh, it means we can be confident that we're getting sort of meaningful results when we get to longer spans. Um, so, and then beyond this, what does this tell us about using optimization as a whole in the design environment? 
well, I mean, design is decision making and what these tools give us is a solid framework to make those decisions. Even if the result isn't used uh, as it is, you know, as it's seen on the screen, optimization shines a sort of light on the cost of the design decisions and pushes us to justify that cost when offset against other benefits. Um, as Ian alluded to clearly at the start, um, we're moving into a new era um, where the resources we use are going to be more closely scrutinized, especially on large projects. Benchmarking design against what we've always done is unlikely to cut it as, as priorities change. Um, so what accessible optimization um, like this might give us is, a, is an opportunity to set a new benchmark in the future. Um, and that's, that's all I've got uh, uh, to import, impart today. Um, Matthew, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dan. That, that's, that's great. Um, and for that matter, thanks uh, to all the other speakers, so to, to Ian, Helen and, and Tom for their contributions. So hopefully you've uh, you found what you've seen and heard interesting and thought provoking. Um, what I would urge you to do is to is to certainly try some of the um, the tools that have been shared today. So that's the um, the layout bridge web app, which uh, as uh, has been mentioned is it, accessible. Um, and as from next Thursday, um, the, the Peregrine um, plugin, that's less accessible. So it does require you to have some um, experience, really, of using that ecosystem, that the Rhino Grasshopper ecosystem. So it isn't going to be for everybody, but it's certainly uh, um, hopefully very, very interesting if you, if you are familiar with that ecosystem. So just to, to sort of conclude, I think, I think, these kind of tools can play a useful role in the development of new, more efficient designs. There's still further work to do. We're aware of that. We're planning follow-up work where we will hopefully be able to take account of wind effects and buildability in, in, in much more detail. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to get funding to allow that work to, uh, to continue in, 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 in the relatively near future. Uh, and finally, before we finish, just to acknowledge uh, the financial support of EPSSC, it's a UK funding body, uh, and also um, colleagues were involved in the build-up project, which basically um, was a precursor to the present project, um, but a a allowed a lot of the sort of underpinning technology to be, to be there for us to, to build on. And in that respect, it also thanks to, to Lin Wei He, who, who developed the first version of the Peregrine plugin. And so thanks, thanks very much. And lastly, Thanks to all of you for, for joining us today. Um, and uh, that's all. Um, thank you for your attention.